What's up all you tabletop players and welcome to Play the Game. Today I'll be teaching you how to play Super Dungeon Explorer The Forgotten King. The Forgotten King is a standalone dungeon crawling game made by Soda Pop Miniatures for 1 to 6 players. It has very RPG like mechanics and aesthetics, which gives the game its own unique charm. The average game time can be anywhere between 90 to 120 minutes, but I assure you that will pass pretty quickly. For the purpose of convenience, I will post timestamps down below so you can skip to the section you believe you're having issues with. Now that we got the intro out of the way, let's dive right into it. Okay, so you decided not to read the rule book, or you're just unsure of a couple of things. We're gonna go step by step and make sure by the end of this video you understand how to play. The goal of the game is simple. Destroy all the spawn points and force the boss to come out of hiding, thrusting both sides in a final confrontation to decide who is triumphant. As I've displayed here, once you've managed to gather your pieces together, the amount of players playing, and what mode you'd like to do, you're ready to begin. Now there is only one of each model, board tile, trap pieces, dice, decks, reference cards, hero and monster cards displayed here. Each hold their own effects, stats, abilities, and purposes. The treasure and loot decks contain items that will eventually go to your backpack. So these red and blue here will eventually go into the backpack to be storing your items. The tile effects are reference cards just like the small mode card and the small boss card. So we have the tile effects pile here that are reference cards, just like the boss reference card here, and the classic mode reference card. All of them are there to remind you of various abilities, conditions, and bonuses that can happen throughout the game. Everything here is included with the base set of the game, and can be played without any additional expansions. Of course, you're free to grab some, like I have right here, with this uh, character called uh, Nyan Nyan. Each character expansion includes a character model, hero, and monster version of their card, and some treasure cards that are exclusive to the expansion, just like this one called Cat's Paw. Gives you plus one red die decks, plus one green die decks, an ability, even gives you an affinity. To start off, we're gonna have to know how to read our cards. We can't exactly do anything unless you know what mechanics, abilities, and actions that are available to you. Reading the card is pretty simple. You just start from the top, we have our character name, the D-pad here with uh, the amount of uh, movement we can take per turn, so this one is 7. The amount of actions we can take per turn, or AP. The different types of banners with uh, our attacks and defense rolls. The wound icon telling us how many hits we take before we die. The potion icon saying how many potions you can carry. And also the card's abilities, right here underneath. Each ability is of a different type and cost. Red meaning that it's a uh, offensive ability. Upon landing a successful hit with the ability, it deals damage. Blue being support, obviously doing some kind of supportive action, and a potion ability that can be used by uh, using the potion that you carry yourself or a teammate's uh, potion. So you don't exactly need to have a potion on you, you can use your teammate's potion to uh, activate your own abilities. Potion abilities like the others are also color coordinated with red being offensive, there's also a blue being a supportive type of potion ability and a green one. It can be used on both the hero turn and the council's turn. So in case of emergency, you could also like try to heal somebody or like stop something from happening. But the potions cannot interrupt other actions. So you have to wait for an action to finish before you can like uh, do an ability that's not on your turn. Lastly, in the center here, we have the uh, affinity. Characters are going to have affinities with different types of crystal colors. If you have an item equipped to the character that has these crystals on it usually, you can do the uh, ability that's uh, usually put on the back of the card so that each character has a list of keywords or uh, the affinity key term telling you what happens. So like 9 lives, 1 use only, or if uh, this ice key icon tells you a model suffering from this may not use uh, actions. Same thing with Knockdown, it'll have a different type of action. And Pounce is a different type of like CC ability. The monster cards are read exactly the same way, except for like the skull icon here. So the council player, which will be the player controlling all the minions and the boss monsters, usually has up to like uh, four points or skull points that they can use in a turn to activate models. So this is what that means. So this requires you to use uh, four skull points to activate uh, the Forgotten King, which is the boss monster. And like uh, anything, they also have affinity and extra abilities, red offensive abilities, supportive, 
And there are banners with their different types of attacks and defense rolls. Now that we understand what our cards do, we can finally start playing. To begin the game, we must take turns placing a board tile on the field for every player. If there are three players playing in total, there will be three board tiles. But for the demo purpose, we'll only be using one tile. Afterwards, we'll place one spawn point and one treasure chest on each tile. So I have my uh, spawn point here, it's a green model for the minion, and the treasure chest. You can place the spawn point anywhere you'd like on the board, or you can place it in an assigned area that's on each board tile. Uh, for this board tile, it's indicated by this white area right here, where I'm pointing. And it has a little evil smiley face on it. So I'll place it right there. And for the treasure chest, regardless of like if there's an assigned area or not, you can place it anywhere. So I'll place it right here in the corner. Next, you're going to have to populate the dungeon. You populate the dungeon by placing as many monsters as possible, two spaces adjacent to the spawn points. Now you can only spawn monsters that are listed on the spawn point card, but all spawn points will be present at the beginning of the game, so you can uh, spawn every single monster technically. Once that's done, you can place the start token within four spaces of an entrance not connected to another tile. So let's say this side is not connected to any other tile, I can place it any four spaces within the entrance. So I'll place it one, two, three, four, right here. The same goes for the heroes when you spawn them in, except it will be only the amount of players participating. So let's say for our purposes that we only have three hero players playing. So I can place them anywhere adjacent to the start point. One here, one here, and one here. And to clarify for the context of the game, adjacent means any space surrounding the model or the space. So adjacent to the start point would be anywhere around it within two spaces, even diagonally. Since classic mode is a versus mode, there will be phases to conduct the hero's turn and the council player's turn. The order of phases starts with the hero's turn. Each hero turn consists of activating two heroes per turn, both one at a time. Once activated and upkeep is over, the player is free to move, take actions, and use abilities. Upkeep takes place at the beginning of a player's activation. During upkeep, a multitude of things can happen. Effects from that model's previous activation ends, princess coins can be spent, healing and status effects may be applied, and any other effects can be applied in the order the player wishes. When either a hero finishes their activation or the council player decides to end their turn, the heroes can then conduct the power-up phase. The power-up phase is quick and simple. Any items that you have collected throughout your turn or kept in your reserve, in your backpack right here, you may then discuss and equip it to your party members. Each item is color corresponded and a player can only equip one of each colored item. If a player wishes to equip an item of the same color, the previous item gets discarded. So as I've set up here, the cat's paw here is a, a green item, can only be equipped to the green slot. And it's indicated by the dots here on the player card. So we have a red, yellow, green, and blue. So that will be equipped to my green slot. And I've equipped the cat's, cat's paw and gained its bonuses. The council turn consists of the same upkeep, activation, and power-up phase. With some small exceptions. During activation, the council player is allowed to spend 4 skull points a turn to activate monsters. That's where the, uh, the skull icon comes in. In addition, they can activate a super monster currently on the board for free on top of their skull points. A super monster is a mini boss usually and can be identified at the bottom right of the monster card. So for instance, we have the Forgotten King here. He is a super monster here. So he can activate a minion and then activate the Forgotten King on top of his four skull points. A mini boss usually only appears when a spawn point is destroyed. When the council's turn is over, it then gets handed back to the hero's turn. However, the heroes that activated previously cannot activate until all other heroes have activated. So what that means is that if this uh, knight here and Nyan Nyan activated the previous turn, they cannot activate until the remaining players have had a turn. Alright guys, I know that was a lot to take in already, but now comes the fun part of any game, the battle. To conduct battle is fairly simple as well. First, you must spend at least one or more AP or action point to conduct a basic attack or ability. Next, determine line of sight. Line of sight is determined as long as you can draw a straight line to the target model. So as you can see here, I have direct line to the target model that I want to attack. 
But for instance, let's say I was behind this bush here. I do not have a direct line of sight because this uh, structure or the bush is uh, blocking my way. Once those are determined, roll the corresponding amount of colored dice and see how many stars you accumulate. So depending on what type of attack you use, you could be using a green dice, a red dice here, which will be the, the most common, along with the blue dice. Then afterwards, you, uh, the defending model will use a banner for a defense roll, indicated by a shield next to the banner. Compare the amount of stars accumulated and if the attacking model had more stars, the attack is successful. So let's say uh, my hero roll had a combined star rating of 4 and my opponent only had a 2, the attack would be successful. If the defending model accumulates the same amount of stars or more, the defense is successful. So if, let's say, they had more stars than me, then they successfully defend. When an attack is successful and you roll an icon, let's say what you roll one of these icons on the dice. So the red and green dice have like potions and potion and hearts. Same thing with the blue dice. You got hearts here. They can give you different bonuses. So if the attack is successful and you roll a blue dice, you can heal a heart. If the attack is successful and you roll a green or red dice, you can gain a potion. Line of sight can be confusing when you want to start attacking, but once you get the hang of it, it should be no problem. Of course, attacks will also have range, so you'll have to determine how much range you have by checking the number indicated on top of the attack icon that you are using. Just like determining movement, as long as you don't go past the amount of spaces allowed, it is within your range, excluding specific types of attacks. There are a variety of in-game events, status effects, crowd control, and area of attacks available as well. I won't be going over all of them, but I will show you an example of each. For in-game events, when a player moves to a new tile, they activate the explorer deck, just like so. Once they cross this new board tile, they activate the explorer deck and they flip the card over. There are two types, board wide and trap placement explorer cards. Both can either give the council player additional buffs, spawn, creeps, abilities, or place traps on the board. Trap templates can be placed on the space only indicated by the card shown right here. So for this uh, 2x2 grid right here, it's called the uh, area zone. So you can only place trap templates in any place that has an area uh, trap template space. To know if a hero triggered a trap, just check if you are on or adjacent to the trap template, just like so, our hero is adjacent to it. It is then activated. Monsters will never trigger traps, but can be affected by one if it is nearby. So let's say the monster is nearby like so, the hero activates the trap and the monster is also affected by it because the hero activated the trap. So it can also be beneficial to the heroes. A hero can only activate one trap per activation. Some may even require an offense roll to resolve, indicated by the star icon on the explorer card. Traps cannot be removed unless disarmed by the disarmed trap basic action. For status effects, they can do various things during upkeep or until removed, including uh, stuff like damage reduction or movement, stats, and preventing abilities. Area of attacks vary as well from affecting models around it in a straight line, cross, or just in a general vicinity. Status effects can do various things during upkeep or until removed, including stuff like uh, damage reduction, reduction of movement or stats, and preventing abilities. Area of attacks can vary as well from affecting models around it in a straight line, cross, or just in the general vicinity. So for instance here I have our icons, our tokens. I believe that the fire here does damage on your upkeep, poison uh, reduces your movement, uh, ice prevents you using from unique actions, knockdown, etc etc. Other things in the game that you should be aware of is Boo Booties and Pets. I know it's a weird name, but these sidekicks and monsters come into play from drawing their perspective cards from the treasure deck. Loot gets collected by defeating the monsters, and treasure is collected from chests and mini bosses. These pets are bound to a player and can be activated like any other model. In addition, they are also considered part of the party, so it's like an extra character. Boo Booties are very similar except in the way that they're used by the council. And once a master or player is defeated, the pet returns to the backpack. So let's say our hero dies, our Madame Hilde, which is bound to our player, goes back to the bag. Same thing will apply if the pet itself dies. Boo booties are a little bit different, they're just removed from the board and they remove, uh, they return to the spawning point. 
If a player dies, a skull token is placed in the space that they were on. So let's say our player is dead. This skull token represents all the equipment that they had previously equipped, and any other player currently on the board can uh, use the basic scavenge action to recover that player's uh, items and return it to the bag. On the other hand, we have a neat token called Prince's Coins. Prince's Coins here are gained by destroying spawn points. Prince's Coins are very valuable. They can either revive a player that has died or heal a player back to full health. Uh, the Princess Coin will spawn on the spawn point space, but do be careful because mini bosses do spawn on the exact same space where the spawn point is destroyed. The last and final thing you should be aware of is the boss fight rulings. This is the highlight of the game and the most challenging. Once the final spawn point has been destroyed, the final boss will immediately spawn on the same space that has been destroyed. You have now triggered the boss fight. So once I have uh, destroyed my spawn here, our final boss spawns in the Forgotten King. And once our boss spawns in, resolve any immediate effects that might happen on the boss reference card, which is right here. And the battle will conduct normally until a timeout occurs. A timeout is indicated once the boss reaches half or more of his wound pool. So let's say his uh, life is 8 right now on his uh, card here. He has 8 life. If it reaches 4 or less, then the timeout immediately happens after the damage resolves. During the timeout, the council immediately follows these steps. You're gonna have to remove all status effects from the dungeon boss, heal the dungeon boss back to half its wound pool, round up if necessary. So let's say it's like at 2 health, it'll go back to 4. Spawn up to 6 skull points of 8-bit or 16-bit monsters from the spawning pool. 8 and 16 bit are identified at the bottom right of the corner of the monster card. So right here will be like where the 8 and 16 bit will be. And then after that, the council player may move his or her boss within 10 space of its current location. So once the timeout occurs, I can move, let's say, over here, here, or over there. A timeout can only occur once per game. There are more basic actions and interactions than I described but that's all up to you to experience and enjoy. Victory is decided once either the council or the heroes are the only ones remaining. Congratulations, you now know how to play Super Dungeon Explorer, The Forgotten King. Hopefully I was clear and concise enough for you to understand the rules and clear up any confusions you might have had. And thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know what you thought of the game and if I happen to miss anything. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to press that thumbs up button. It really helps out and lets me know you're enjoying the content and click that subscribe button if you want to see future videos. Thanks again, and let's play the game.